Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are sitting uh, in the world. A very well, warm welcome from uh, Milan. Very hot and very sunny today to the 10th session of uh, Imagine. Before I will start to introduce the guest and the topic of the day, I want just to remind us which is the purpose of uh, Imager. Uh, with Imager, we will have some quality time to reflect uh, as uh, individuals on uh, relevant questions that not necessarily are close to our business intent, business purpose, or ways of working. We had the chance, and we will have the chance to do that with the help of uh, a number of external guests that will bring an outside in perspective to UCB and that hopefully will help us and will inspire us to articulate problems and solutions in a, a very different way and to look at uh, societal challenges uh, in a, a different way compared to what, let's say, we are used to do at the inside, from the inside of the organization. Uh, today, we will meet Michela Marzano. Michela, welcome. I will try to introduce you in uh, the best possible way. So I could uh, use, uh, in a way, many different entry points to introduce uh, Michela, um, starting from the fact that she's Italian, as I am, and uh, adding that she lives in Paris since many years, and that she's a full professor of uh, moral philosophy at the University of Paris. She used to be, since 2013 to 2018, a member of the Italian Parliament. She is a philosopher, she is a writer, she is a, a columnist for some of the most relevant Italian newspapers. But above everything else, I think you will have today the chance to appreciate that she is a wonderful, energetic woman, <laughs> that is extremely passionate about uh, uh, human beings and human dynamics. So welcome again. Thank you very much. Today, Michela will uh, help us to explore and uh, reflect on the concept of trust and the role that trust has in our society. So um, we are in the virtual UCB space. We have uh, probably already many, many colleagues connected from uh, all over the world. So I would uh, kick off inviting all the colleagues while following you, Michela, and following in a way the flow uh, to post any type of questions, comments or reflection, because in the second half of uh, the hour, we will have the chance to address at least uh, some of them. So back to our, let's say, starting point, the basic, Michela, what is trust and why trust is foundational in our society? I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ilaria. Good morning, good afternoon, good night to everybody. I will speak in Italian. I'm sorry for the not Italian speaking people, but once in Italian may be interesting even for English speaker, native uh, and for French people. Okay, quindi buongiorno, buon pomeriggio. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. I'm very happy to join this set of meetings. And I have to say that I'm also quite emotional of being here and to be able to speak my mother tongue. Ilaria just um, reminded that I'm Italian, but since 20 years by now, since 1998, I live, work and teach in France. So the topic of trust is something I normally discuss in French with my students. It's uh, very interesting uh, to use my mother tongue to uh, speak to you about trust. What is trust? Trust is uh, a complex um, topic because it is uh, a paradoxical uh, topic too. Why is that? Because from a certain point of view, trust is really fundamental. Without trust, society shatters. Without trust, we wouldn't have any sort of social relationships. With no trust, you would have uh, even problems in getting up from your bed in the morning, to have breakfast, to get out of your house, drink your coffee, catch the metro, and so on. Of course, these examples are less adequate to the pandemic or post-pandemic uh, time we are living because we spend a lot of time at home. But we need to have trust in the capability we will have, for example, to... 
connect to our computer and the trust in being able to join a meeting, some calls, trust in the fact that everybody, everything will function. So trust is, is at the basis of society relationships and it is the only possibility to be able to think and think about our futures and to build it. At the same time though, and here's the paradox about trust, it is also a concept and something which is extremely dangerous. Why is that? Because any time I trust somebody, I immediately start a sort of uh, addiction. I believe in you and this fact makes me vulnerable. So I am vulnerable because it is you that decide um, if you are, a, you can live up to my standards uh, or if you want to uh, just uh, betray me. So we have this idea of uh, betraying people, and after all, it's really the people we trust who are the ones who can let us down. If I don't trust somebody, that particular person may disappoint me, but they cannot betray me. It's the wife, the husband who betrays, it's the patriot who betrays, it's the homeland, it's somebody, uh, a worker, um, which was trusted by the company who can betray. So betraying is possible only when you have trust. And that's why trust is paramount. With no trust, you have no family, no society, no company, no future with trust, without trust. At the same time, anytime you trust somebody, we become vulnerable. So how can we define trust? How can we uh, break this paradox? How, how can you build trust and rebuild it? when, you know, it has been shattered. Um, the first time that we started talking about the crisis of trust, back in 2008, we had a subprime crisis, and we spoke in those days about the need to refine trust. We're speaking about trust these days. We need to trust doctors, experts, uh, vaccines, uh, chemicals. So we need to have um, trust in all these things. But can we just decide to have trust for it to come back? and be real again, then that last questions, then we'll pass to the answers, don't worry. Can you trust somebody if nobody has ever believed in our in ourselves? So if we don't believe in ourselves, what's the relationship between the trust in itself, in yourself, and the trust towards the others? Just to um, start providing some replies I'd like to kick off with a quotation. You probably know that all philosophers like quotations, but I'm only going to use a couple of um, uh, quotations. The one we have right now is uh, from a very important contemporary um, sociologist, Gerd Zimmel, and in a book which dates back to um, 1908, um, which has been re-translated in 1988, and the official title is a sociology a quest on the form of associations. And uh, Simmel is analyzing the structure of uh, the organizations and associations. Well, he discussed the topic of trust. In order to define trust, Simmel writes, one believes in a person without this trust being justified by the fact that that person in question is worthy. Sometimes, even without any proof, of his or her reliability. End of quotation. Why did I want to start with uh, these uh, few words, which are very meaningful indeed? Well, um, I think they're very interesting from a semantic point of view. Let's try to focus on the terms that uh, uh, this um, sociologist has chosen. Um, believe in French, it's a term that normally you use when you speak about faith. I believe in God, you know. You believe in somebody in this particular case without a distrust. So we're already facing an overlapping of the plan of faith and trust, but at the same time, these two ideas are really intertwined. So we believe in somebody without a justification um, of this. So the philosopher is telling us that in order to believe in somebody, I do not need to uh, rely on his or her reliability. That's uh, why, uh, without this person being reliable, I need to uh, trust this person. 
we need to focus as well on the particular time. This is the beginning of the 20th century. We broke the traditional paradigm of trust for centuries. So trust has been considered and conceptualized as a consequence of reliability. So I trust you if and only if you are reliable. Um, in the 19th century, the idea of reliability is really broken down because it is the context within reliability um, existed, which was the context of honor for centuries, at least in Western countries. We had a society based on honor. Anybody who uh, breached trust and reliability was considered like somebody to um, avoid. It was better to lose your life than uh, losing your reliability. So this was um, something which existed as well in a religious and social religious context. When honor is abandoned, it's put aside in the 19th century and we face, uh, uh, with Mandeville and Anna Smith, we face to the birth of uh, uh, the economic society. Honor is considered a fiction and honor is replaced by interest, the maximum interest for the individual and the maximum interest for a collectivity. So we imagine we can't. Uh, rely on trust anymore. Uh, the reliability doesn't justify uh, trust. What about trust, though? Because we only need to maximize the interest. I apologize for this very quick uh, summary, but that's why Zimmel uh, introduces this novelty. So trust is not based on reliability, but it's the other way around. So it is trust which creates reliability. So in other terms, when I trust somebody, I commit myself. And it's like a bet, because I can have also the possibility to lose my bet. Remember uh, Pascal, who said, uh, I believe, and then it's like a bet, because, you know, what I believe can, can be confirmed or not. So you bet on somebody, for example, and you hope that the fact that I am trusting this person, and hopefully this person is going to be reliable as well in the end. So it's a sort of um, uh, creative power of trust, which is not a consequence anymore, but actually the cause of uh, reliability. And we have a very beautiful example, and I'm going to stop down. This is an example from uh, literature. It's a novel that uh, probably most of you have read. Um, it's Les Miserables by Hugo. In this novel, we have uh, Jean Valjean history. He uh, had stolen a piece of bread, went to jail, becomes a convict, tries to escape on several occasions. And then at some point, which is an adult, he succeeds in escaping and he's welcomed uh, in a bishop's um, home. And the first thing that he does when he's welcome is steal again. So he steals the candelabra and cutlery because they were in silver. He's stopped by the gendarmerie, by the police, and he tries to tell them, well, you know, I haven't really stolen the candelabra, the silver candelabra. They were a gift. So the police um, called the bishop and asked them, ask him what really happened. And the bishop replies, it is true. I have given the silver candelabra to Jean Valjean. And then he says to him, do something with this trust. From that time on, Jean Valjean, or somebody nobody has ever believed in, feels that somebody trusts him and is going to do everything to live up to the standards that the, uh, uh, the bishop um, had in him. So he changed totally his behavior. Trust um, produces reliability, and this happens mostly within relationships. Um, what I mean is that uh, in uh, love relationships can only start when I bet on somebody, when I decide that I want to make myself vulnerable and I hope that the other person welcomes the trust I put in him or her and does everything not uh, to breach my trust, even though this can only be valid in a different context from the uh, social relationships. And we have to take into consideration, and then I'm going to stop, that there's a difference. Uh, of uh, levels um, in the context of trust. But before I go on, I'd like to give the floor back to Ilaria. With pleasure, Michaela. 
voluntarily and, and voluntarily. <laughs> so the first thing that to, I, I need to do is uh, to highlight that it seems that there is an issue with the English uh, sound in a way. So the meeting that is held in a way in English. Uh, I know that the technical team is looking into that. Uh, there is a suggestion for the attendees. In the meantime, we will find a solution to activate the automatic subtitles. Uh, perhaps uh, this will help uh, and hopefully we will uh, fix it soon. So, but back to our conversation and again, Michele, it was so natural for me to, to kick off in Italian in a way again, while it's uh, English in a way, the, the, the language I'm supposed to interact with you. Um, you mentioned this uh, nice and element, uh, very, very interesting of uh, trust uh, as a productive uh, in uh, any type of relationship from a personal and societal perspective. Can we perhaps uh, expand a bit this concept and try to see if, let's say, trust is can be productive also from the perspective of a company as UCB? And if yes, why from your perspective? Allora, intanto right. uh, io farei un piccolo passaggio lessicale. I'd like to focus a bit on um, wordings because we're talking about trust. But in English, and you probably know this better than I do, there are two terms which are slightly different that you can use when you speak about trust. Because in Italian, for example, we only have one term, we only have the word fiducia. In French as well, we only have the word confiance. And in French, in English, sorry, um, we have trust. But we also have reliance, which is linked to the reliability idea. These are two wordings, reliance, Reliability allows you to think uh, trust in terms of competencies. I cannot trust my plumber if he doesn't have a whole set of skills, just like, you know, you can't trust a doctor if that doctor hasn't been able to diagnose uh, an illness, just like you can't trust, for example, a big pharma if there was a scandal concerning a particular chemical and that we discover that uh, maybe somebody lied in that context. I open a parenthesis, you know better than I do all the polemics and problems we're facing right now um, on the problem of vaccines. And um, we have to speak about communication in this context because we had the wrong communication from expert political leaders, journalists, um, on, for example, the AstraZeneca vaccine. In Italy, for example, we had a um, whole set of discussions. You can't use that vaccine after 60. No, it's not true. You have to use it before uh, 50 years old. Uh, then minor uh, children also can use them. Uh, then there was an accident. So we decided that we can use AstraZeneca after 60 years of age. Then we need to make a hybrid with some other vaccine. Sorry for this uh, parenthesis, but this was uh, just an example of trust and uh, of uh, the need to have a real communication to avoid chaos. Um, so we speak about reliability. But when you um, rely on a certain amount of, of competencies and skills, it's not enough because we still have this uh, idea of bet. Let's think again and focus again on the uh, uh, doctors, uh, teacher, and speakers, public speakers um, example. They, all these people need to be reliable. They need to be able to show they have a certain amount of uh, um, skills and for people to go and listen to the conference, for students uh, to keep uh, going to classes, for people to keep going to the same doctors. But at the same time, nothing happens if if. Uh, you don't add uh, also the dimension of trust to the initial dimensions of uh, reliability. This is a productive bet, and I'm um, going to the uh, uh, real context of the question. I'm going to provide a personal example. My French is called Jacques. His, um, French is very similar to the Italian uh, men. I'm quoting this just to say that very often the national context doesn't really affect your partner's or husband's behavior. And in Jacques, it's totally, totally unreliable. 
when I used to travel all the time between France and Italy because I was um, a parliament member, uh, there was no way I could hope to find a full fridge when I arrived back home at midnight on a Friday night. The fridge was empty all the time. And even when I used to leave uh, the famous studio lease for him, uh, he used to lose it. And I remember that one day I was in the parliament um, in a full session debating a very important uh, topic, uh, telephone rings. I answered because I was worried what happened. It was at the supermarket asking me, what was, what was I supposed to buy? So totally unreliable. But Jacques, despite all that, is the person I trust the most. And why is that? Because he's the only one who recognizes for who I am. He's the only one really reliable on the very important things. He's the only one who doesn't ask me to change and to be something different from what I am. So he's the only one who trusts me. So the trust is um, uh, automatically fed. So if we leave uh, the private contact and move to the professional one, we, we discover that we need all these kind of paths because we need to, to actually rely on people. Because on one side, this is a stimulus for those who work with us to show they can live up to our expectations. But on the other side, uh, they need to have a whole set of skills to show that they're reliable. And the other person needs to have the capacity um, to build up a network after that we have worked at all levels in companies and schools, in hospitals. We used to function with a sort of uh, top-down um, management style. We have realized that um, teams used to uh, function much better if uh, uh, their members trusted each other. So this is the cooperation process indeed. And that's why I trust you, that I expect you to be able to respect the trust I offered you. But at the same time, when you trust me, we have a bond, we have a solid bond. So that's the only way really that allow us, in my opinion, within a private society, but also within a company, uh, in the society overall, the only thing I was saying that allows us to um, work together on uh, complex uh, projects, having at the same time an eye on the future. That's why I need to go back to trust, not just deciding this out of the blue, but realizing that um, productivity is involved as well in the process. So, so, but we do take a risk because if nobody takes a risk because they want to protect themselves and just uh, um, as be stuck in their own corner, then, you know, trust doesn't take off. So we need to be able to, uh, to make bets, but also we need to rely on truth. One of the problems that we're facing in the uh, mistrust of society that we live in is the fact that for too long, the intellectuals, um, policymakers, um, doctors, and so on, made certain promises, but they were fully aware of the fact that these promises were impossible to uh, be kept. But we need to find, again, truth. I remember when I used to be a deputy and we uh, needed to rely on, on authenticity. We can't uh, breach the trust. We need to find some possible targets, otherwise breach the trust. We need to be aware and to describe the possibility and the obstacles that we face during our path. And this is something I reproach even in the pandemic period, because lots of experts uh, made lots of promises. They uh, announced far too much uh, compared to what they really knew. And this really created a trust crisis. If you want to call it in another way, it is also a form of um, it's a form of conspiracy. Because these days you don't believe in anything else. You know, uh, politicians, intellectuals, they're not respected anymore. People don't believe in them anymore. Because uh, intellectuals, for example, want to have a say in the matter on anything. There's a word I can't translate, uh, dalle tuttologo. Uh, it is somebody who wants to have a uh, say in the matter on anything. You know, they take the word on everything. So that's why these people can be reliable. And this only uh, 
provides uh, the idea that this person is not reliable. That's why the doubt, which is at the basis, even from a philosophical point of view of knowledge, if you think about Descartes, for example, I think before I am, everything starts from yourself. In order to have a real, well-grounded knowledge, I start doubting about everything I've been told. When I doubt about everything, I doubt everything, but from the fact that I'm doubting. But if I do that, that means that I'm thinking. And that if I'm thinking, I do exist. That's how you come from the doubt, the certainty of your existence. So what we have these days is a circle of doubt. It is not about uh, there, you know, profound knowledge, but it is a circle of doubt. A doubt because a doubt because a doubt. End of story. The Novaks, for example, the Novaks people, just to provide an obvious example, these are people that do not follow and do not want to follow any form of reasoning because they start from the idea that the premises, the assumptions, initial assumptions are fake. So they don't believe in any form of assumptions. I don't, I'm, I don't know if you ever tried to discuss with the Novaks but it's like having somebody coming from a sex. They don't listen to you. They don't use their brain. They don't make connections, links, you know, and that's the real problem. So how do we arrive to that sort of situation with a whole heap of lies in the time? That's why I need to go back to something which is linked to truth and then making bets, you know? I'm going to bet on you. Grazie, Michela. Thank you. It's... Um... It has been, in a way, a wonderful uh, journey around uh, the element, in a way, of trust connected to truth. Um, and you are right, in a way, we are uh, discouraged, probably, as a citizen, as human being, in a way, to really practice uh, trust uh, in, a, in a massive way in this uh, society. As you mentioned at the beginning, uh, trust is not free of charge. There is an element of risk behind that. There is a bet, as you said. So. Uh, can you help us to, to figure out uh, how we can, in a way, bet as a human being, uh, as uh, parents, as professionals, in every dimension, in a way, of our life? This is a main point, because in order to uh, make the circle a square, we have to realize that if it is true, that trust is productive, it is also true that productivity is not a necessary consequence. And there's always a possibility for the person who has received our trust that lets us down or breaches our trust. So, in this context, what is the necessary condition without which we can't bet and we can't trust anybody? Certainly, we're in the position where you were a bit discouraged, just like Hilaria said before, beforehand. So why giving our trust to somebody? Why making us vulnerable? The problem, like we said beforehand, is that if you don't bet, society is not going to start again. So what's the condition which allow us to bet without a shelter in front of the possibility uh, of a failure? Why should I bet on my son while he's maybe doing drugs? I'm not sure he's going to be able to quit drugs? Why should I bet on a man if I've been um, betrayed beforehand or, or women if I like women? So that's a condition which is the trust. You need to have a minimum of trust in yourself in order to bet and actually trust the others. What is it? What is this uh, trust in yourself? It's not the self-esteem in itself. You know, the famous uh, managerial competence it is something that we heard quite a lot during the last years. So for example, you were in front of a coach claiming you have to believe in yourself, uh, not to need the others, because that's totally the opposite. I'm trying to uh, show you. So they need to make uh, society work again. Is the need to depend on the other and to accept the fact that actually you do depend on the others and that you are vulnerable. Trust in itself, the thing I'm, I'm discussing right now, is being aware of your value. This allows you to bet. Why is that? Because if the other should actually breach my trust, I wouldn't feel uh, worthless. 
for what it is uh, the awareness of your own value. I'm not sure you remember uh, when you used to go to school back then, or if you studied philosophy, maybe, maybe you discovered that later. But you, I'm not sure you remember Kant, the famous uh, philosopher. Kant has been the very first one in um, the main terms to explain that the main characteristic of a person is he, her dignity. That's the term that Kant uses. Dignity means um, intrinsic value. So there's a difference between the world of objects and the world of people because um, objects have a price and an instrumental value which raises or goes down according uh, to the demand. So prices rises on the basis of demand, on the basis of the utility of the product. It goes down if that bottle of water is empty or broken. It doesn't have a price anymore because it doesn't have a value anymore. When it comes down to people, and that's the difference with objects, never have a price, but they always have a dignity. So they have um, an intrinsic, inherent value, which is independent of what they are or their differences. If they are men, women, homosexual, heterosexual, if they are white, yellow, people's value, the intrinsic value of a person never changes and it's always there. So from uh, an ontologic point of view, that's the definition of a person, of a person value. Having said that, uh, it is useless knowing that every single person has um, an in inherent value, if I'm not aware of my own value. And that's the basis for me to bat and to su survive should I face some um, breaching of my trust. And you obtain this when you are recognized. That's a key concept from the beginning to the end of your life is the recognition of uh, you being recognized and of knowledge for what you are. This is something which starts in your childhood through the idea of love because our parents uh, recognize us um, what we are. They love us because they recognize us. The problem with all parents is that they would want their children to be, to fit actually the image they have in their own uh, mind. So you're going to be, you will become, you will repair, you will um, pay off, you will obtain everything I haven't obtained. So it's a projection of yourself. But if I project myself on my children, I do not see them for what they are. I see my, my son and my daughter uh, for what I project on them. And how can children be aware of their value if they're not acknowledged and recognized uh, by their parents, teachers and professors later on, by their employers, because this um, process goes on all the time. And then there are two other concepts the right to work, um, um, a knowledge in a state, if that state has a legislation which allows me to be recognized despite the differences. In Italy, how can women be recognized and how can we believe in ourselves and trust ourselves and bet on the others when the state um, doesn't support us? And so we have to have uh, double, triple days doing so many things uh, all together. This is also true for other countries, but that's particularly true in Italy. So how can you be knowledge for what you are in a country where there's, there's not the possibility for homosexual people to get married and to be recognized as parents of their children? I mean, somebody needs to be recognized uh, from the legal context as well, notwithstanding their diversity. And then, of course, uh, and I'm going to uh, close down of work, how can you recognize each other within a team, for example? If you don't have a job, or if, you're, if you are frustrated by people with whom we work, we lose faith in ourselves and we also lose the strength uh, to bet. That's why we need to be knowledge and that's why the others need to bet on us. That's a circle which is a self uh, building circle in order to uh, bat on the other's projects and surviving to the possible um, 
breaching of trust. So th thank you, Michela. Very, very clear. And again, very, very inspiring. Um, I got in a way from the chat that we still have a bit of an issue with the English, uh, in a way, session. So uh, I will try now to start to address some of the questions that we collected in, uh, in the um, chat. So th the first one is coming from the uh, Italian, in a way, chat. And I will read it in Italian so you will see, in a way, that somehow it's very connected with what you just mentioned. So. Um, mi piace moltissimo il concetto di ricostruzione della fiducia. I really like the idea of rebuilding trust after it has been breached. Can you please elaborate on that? Uh, what is, let's say, the failure uh, of uh, a trust uh, relationship in a way? So uh, what does it mean to rebuild, in a way, trust? And you mentioned already, let's say, this element of the recognition. So what could really kick off uh, the process where, where trust, in a way, can be rebuilt? Allora, effettivamente il punto di Right. Yes, acknowledgement is our starting point. If we do not start, and then when I when I speak about that, I also mean listening to the others, listening to yourself, but really listening to yourself. What's the problem with facing these days? We pretend we, we're listening. So you certainly have been in a situation where during a working meeting, you interrupt a speaker and you tell them, I have understood, I know what you mean. But what you're really saying to this person in this context, are you referring to what they're saying or to what you would have said had you been in the place of that person? Because very often, indeed, we understand what we would have said if we were in their positions. But listening means accepting um, difference. So that means accepting that the otherness authority hit hits us in our face. Authority has to hit our dimension and we resist because it's difficult for us to rediscuss ourselves, you know. But it's, that's the only way to listen and to recognize and acknowledge the other. I'm bringing this up to say that without recognition, there's no possibility to bet, without the possibility to bet on the other. So trust doesn't even kick off. So that's why you need to be able to acknowledge the others. And in order to do that, first of all, you need to acknowledge yourself in the first place. You need to be able to accept your own authority, to accept your own limits and um, fragility. When you look at yourself in the mirror, I'm, I'm sure that you have all been in that situation. If you're really honest, you look in, in the mirror and you discover they're less intelligent, less good looking, less brilliant, you're always something less compared to what you would have liked yourself to be. But it's only making peace to this perception, because that's true anyway for everybody, because all of us uh, would like to have uh, uh, some other qualities that others have, even if the others would like to have the qualities that we have. That, that's, you know, the way things are. And it's only when you make peace with your own perception of being something less that you actually accept yourself and you can indulge the luxury to uh, accept yourself. And that's the moment when trust and now I, I have, uh, Michele, another question that uh, on which will be really great to have uh, your view. It's a bit more provocative for us as an industry. You mentioned before the specific case of a uh, vaccine in a way and the mistrust that unfortunately is, uh, uh, is present in a way in our society due to a number of probably miscommunication and, uh, let's say, factors that you have uh, smartly in a way summarized before. The question is uh, more, in a way, asking you an opinion. When um, um, we look, in a way, to the industry, to our industry, pharmaceutical industry, from outside, and you are an external type of observer, okay? We know very well that our industry has a very poor reputation in the space we operate in. And this is a damage in multiple dimensions. It's a damage for some of the reasons that you just mentioned, for example, the case of vaccine, but it's a damage also because it's preventing probably us as an industry to collaborate and to build a certain type of partnership with society that could be extremely beneficial for the patient, for the citizens in a way. 
So there is a basic level in a way of uh, mistrust in a way with a number of probably reasons behind. Uh, you, you mentioned in a way that there is an history probably of uh, liars that led in a way to, to the mistrust. So do you have an opinion and do you have in a way a suggestion for us an, as an industry on how we can do better in that? Allora, uh, yes. I have an idea about that, and of course, you need to better understand uh, how feasible is that and so on. But let's go back to the vaccine example to start with. Vaccines have been discovered very quickly, also thanks to a whole set of uh, state um, contributions which have been granted to companies and research, uh, pharma, reserves and labs. After that, we discovered the vaccine and then uh, people started uh, being polemic. Uh, do we keep the patent? Uh, uh, do we get rid of it? Who's going to produce? Who's going to make money out of it? But we have to, and I mean all citizens, we need to believe again in the rightness of uh, the pharmaceutical um, industries. Um, uh, good behavior. We need to speak in terms of uh, the good um, reputation of a company. For certain uh, chemicals, you need to be able to suspend, for example, to uh, make benefits, not because, you know, we don't uh, have to uh, maximize your dividends. Of course, uh, nobody is uh, naive enough to deny that. But that's possible if the image of that particular company is an image uh, based on admiration, based on trust. And because trust is something we have to rebuild, we need to bet on something. And who is it that can bet if not those who have the possibility to do that? And so a pharmaceutical company has the possibility through certain um, chemicals to show their own ideals, uh, to show that they have a path, they have uh, um, some projects. Then, of course, you know, the idea of patents, vaccines, uh, it's quite complex, not just the capacity of being able to produce. So we have, uh, um, you know, banalize the situation. But first of all, we need to explain things really clearly. I'm not an expert, that that's what I'm trying to do. You know, we need to be able to understand the difference between um, give up the patent and then uh, produce the chemical, you know, because really the resistance uh, to suspend the get rid of the patent is because the pharmaceutical um, companies want to make money on the pandemic. But that's not the way things are. We have to explain to people that we are facing a production problem. And then later on, some companies, of course, can make their force uh, and producing uh, uh, these uh, drugs and giving them to those who can't afford them, just like, for example, the uh, developing countries. Because uh, from a selfish point of view, if the world population is not totally vaccinated, the economy is not going to restart again. Once again, fair enough, you know, we are living in a utilitaristic system uh, based on consequences. So we have to focus on the maximization of results, you know, fair enough. You know, this is uh, the idea of uh, utilitarianism, but we have a short-term and long-term consequence. So let's focus on the long-term of a short-term decision which can look uh, bad, but then in the long term is going to entail a whole set of secondary and then primary advantages. That's the only suggestion I feel I can provide to you. In a, in a way, it's um, a clear recommendation uh, to work better on, uh, on communication, in a way, probably on clarity and, uh, and uh, transparency. And I think that uh, uh, it's really, in a way, appropriate. There is uh, so much room, in a way, for improvement also from uh, from our side, and we really need to play a role in that. Ilaria, perdonami, uh, c'è un'altra cosa terminologica che secondo me è importante. Excuse me, there is another term terminologic aspect which is important. We'll speak in terms of the transparency, but transparency is not truth. There's a difference between truth and transparency. Truth 
is not uh, transparency. One thing is saying something true and not lying. Transparency is saying everything, just like uh, the old good uh, Manuel Kant used to say. Uh, one thing is not saying anything which is not true. So one thing is not lying to somebody, and one thing is saying the truth without saying the whole truth, because us, as human beings, we can't, and we don't have to be transparent. We need to have some part of uh, dullness, so to speak, which allow us to uh, survive, for example, uh, in the um, political context of a country, or also in uh, your context, you don't have to be totally transparent, you need to be true, you need to communicate truth, and you have to keep for yourself information which are not necessary to spread. The more you say, the more people are showered with details, but they can't manage, you know, because they can't see the I red thread. Of that's why it's in a way, because you, you're right, we abuse probably the word transparency, and perhaps we could in a way uh, deviate more on the side of truth rather than in a way transparency itself. So it's a, it's a wonderful advice. Uh, I will bring you back in a way, in a more in a way human type of dimension uh, and reflection uh, around uh, around trust. And the question that I see in the chat is uh, referring to one of the points that you touched during our uh, conversation. So how trust fit in companies and, uh, and leadership? So we are all in a way evolving as an uh, organization uh, our leadership in a way model that is uh, every day less uh, hierarchical, but uh, every day more in a way horizontal somehow. So uh, this requires a different type of mindset and a different type of skills in our leaders. Uh, so um, how do you see this transformation from an organizational perspective, but also from a societal in a way perspective, because it's not just uh, in the context of a highly structured organization as the one we are, we are in, do you see any unlock potential behind, in a way, a new concept of leadership for us, in a way, as human being or for us as a society? Allora, sì e no. Cioè, una nuova... Yes, I know. A new leadership, which is not that new. So what we need, my opinion, is for somebody who's uh, reliable and to have an authority. What is it? It is something, a skill, which allows the speaker to totally catch the listener's attention. According to studies, after eight minutes, uh, people are not attentive anymore. If, for example, when I speak in Italian to an Italian audience or when I speak French to a French audience, I uh, can't uh, attract people's attention after those 80 minutes, that means that I'm not um, authoritative enough, I'm not reliable enough. If I just um, can't have my students follow my lessons online as well, just like some of my colleagues who, for example, during the department uh, meetings, uh, used to say that uh, they had just a 30% of attendees. And that means that they're not influential enough. What does that mean? Uh, being cooperative means that uh, you are trusted. I don't allow uh, the fact that I'm facing a black uh, shade in front of me. I don't see my audience. I'm not get distracted by fly and just, uh, you know, rely on my value and I'm real. When I'm saying that, when I say I'm real, I'm, I'm claiming that I have the strength to control things the way they are and I'm strong enough to acknowledge my mistakes and my fragile points. Rather, I rely on them. I, I, I name them. I define my anxiety, my, my stress, my depression. Anyway, we all go through anxiety, stress, and so on. And this is what allows me to have a more human relationship and to acquire a certain um, uh, influence and to accept the fact that the uh, others are bad on us. Leaders make bets, but those who are beyond the leaders have to make bets as well because we have an up and down movement in the trust relationship. And I'm saying that because in order to catch back uh, awareness in my own values, I had to uh, 
go through 20 years of uh, psychoanalysis. And after that, I can say that for 20 years, I had some uh, um, anorexia and bulimia problems. I took some chemicals. I attempted suicide. Yes, I've done all that. I've been through all that. That's my weakness, but that's my force as well. That's my strength. I remember when I wrote the book, I wanted to be a butterfly. My mother was terrified, said to me, you're showing off your uh, weaknesses. I said, no, mom, I'm showing off my strength because after a long path through psychoanalysis, I can name my weakness. And I'm bringing this up because all these uh, knowledge and process which doesn't depend on us. Am I knowledge for what I am? No. Then, of course, I have to, you know, uh, lift my sleeves and I need to work on it. I need to be able to acknowledge myself for what I am, even if I'm not. Why am I bringing this up? Because very often you look for a way to make models for skills. And that makes me laugh because um, Clubhouse, for example, and other websites and other tutorials explain to you how to um, speak in public. Uh, you open your eyes, so either you uh, follow those seminars or you made them. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I, that makes me laugh because the, there's not a specific recipe. Nobody teaches how to attract attention. Because attracting attention on our own words means that we believe in what we say. And that means that we believe in our project. And believing in our project means that you need to be passionate about what you do. That's a leader. You need to love what you do. You need just open to open the window and show off your passion, your enthusiasm. That's something that you can't learn. I remember during our last uh, department meeting in front of uh, lots of students, uh, somebody said we need some um, courses in order to take the floor in face in front of uh, 500 students. And then I said to myself, you know, you're not doing the right job because if you're a teacher, you still need uh, to actually control these wild students. You're in the wrong job. It doesn't matter, you know. Of course, they're wild, but it's nice to see them as small chicks that bring, growing up, you know, they, they grow up and they try to provoke you and so on. But that's what happens every day. You know, when you're facing a manager, when you're facing somebody who's um, looking for the limits, that means that they're there to find these limits. So it's really this uh, capacity of looking at people, which is important. When I know my audience, when I have passion, the path is really downward. Thank you, Michela. Thank you so much for um, sharing all these uh, great, in a way, food for thought, uh, pieces of uh, personal experiences. So we are really grateful. I think that after this hour together, everyone in a way uh, will find himself or herself uh, in the description of, uh, I made in a way of you when introducing uh, you as a guest here. Uh, we had the chance to really see your passion for a human being and uh, for human dynamics. So it was uh, yeah, really, yeah. really great. Yeah. Can I ask you something, Ilaria? I kept quotation, quotation from my book, I want to be a butterfly, which is about trust, control, and knowledge. In a way that I really say goodbye to all the people that were with us today. So the last word will be, will, will be in a way, your word for, uh, for our attendees. Great gift, uh, Michela, to have you with us. I just want to remind before letting you closing, in a way, the meeting with uh, uh, this, in a way, a uh, few words from your book is that there will be another seminar on the 13th of, uh, uh, of June, in a way, of July, I think. So before the summer uh, the summer break. So keep uh, stay tuned, in a way, with Image. Michela, thank you again. And uh, the last uh, floor is for you. Thank you very much. It took me years to realize that disobeying to my father doesn't mean um, betraying him. That I call, and I was able not to follow 
disorders without being a naughty child. It took me years not to be a prisoner of that uh, emotional short circuit because when I was a child, I was the one who had been mistrust all the single times I couldn't uh, have expressed my anxiety and my fear all the times I had just adapted not to uh, be a problem and a nuisance to my parents. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody. And sorry, probably the, the next time in English, I will study. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, bye-bye. Bye. bye. bye.